everyone, I'm Melissa from Knitting the Stash, and this is episode 40 in the podcast series. Kind of exciting to make it to 40 and to have met so many of you guys and talked to so many of you on Ravelry and through YouTube um, and on Instagram. So thank you so much for creating this awesome community. If you are new, this is a podcast about uh, knitting and sometimes spinning, largely about garment design and modification. So if you're into those things, you're in the right place. Uh, I am coming to you from Urbana, Illinois. It is a lovely Saturday. My son has been trying out for high school soccer and he just found out he made the team. So give him a, like a collective cheer. He'll be very happy to know <laughs> that you guys are all supporting him as well. Uh, so he's at an early morning practice and I have the house to myself for about half an hour. So I'm going to see how much I can get done here. <laughs> um, uh, like I said, I'm coming to you from Urbana. I'm a professor here at the University of Illinois and Today's show is all about cashmere. Well, not all about cashmere, but it, cashmere is so wonderful that it's hard for things not to be all about cashmere when they're about cashmere. So I want to talk to you about June cashmere and uh, some sample knitting I'm doing for them. Uh, I have the finished object of the uh, Remake Along Better Sweater series, which I want to briefly just mention to you guys. Uh, I have a new sweater on the needles, uh, another test knit. There's just so much going on. It's been kind of a crazy month. So I'm going to do my best to kind of pare it all down, give you some cool information, and uh, share a nice half hour with you guys. So let's jump into uh, finished objects first, just so that I can show you guys, uh, in case you haven't been following the Better Sweater series, which is a subset of videos that I put together on a playlist. Uh, for the remake along uh, for 2018. The, uh, if you haven't been following that series, I wanted to let you all know that the sweater I was remaking is done. <laughs> and uh, I'm pretty excited about it. I'm calling it the Phoenix Pullover and uh, I'm in the midst of uh, test knitting right now. And I have some wonderful, wonderful test knitters out there who are doing a huge amount of awesome knitting for this pattern and I'm so thankful for them. So um, to all of you test knitters, you have my heartfelt <laughs> appreciation that you're out there working on this sweater. Uh, so this sweater should be available, I'm hoping sometime in September. It'll be fully um, test knit by that point. In a, a few sizes, uh, I'm keeping this uh, size range pretty small because it's my first uh, sweater garment pattern, so it goes from 32 up to 40. I'm hoping in the future to increase that range, and my test knitters are really helping me um, think about different kinds of um, body proportion kinds of issues and things uh, for future designs. So I'm really, really thankful to them and so excited that the sweater is finished and the pattern is written and it's being test knit. So excitement all around. And I thought I'd just have it here with us because it's just always fun to have like a new sweater <laughs> and it's the middle of summer here. I can't wear it so I can at least admire it um, sitting on this mannequin next to me for a little while. <laughs> Uh, so that's the Phoenix uh, pullover, and like I said, you'll, you'll hear a little bit more about it uh, once we get the test knitting done and the pattern is actually released. I'll make sure I put a, a coupon code out for all of you guys who are interested in knitting it, and I think we might even have a knit-along. Uh, someone suggested that we do a knit-along, um, and I think I might uh, take you guys up on that if you're interested. So more on that in the fall. Okay, so if that's finished objects, uh, I <laughs> immediately cast on a new sweater. Who am I if not a sweater knitter? Uh, so mine, it's, I struggle a little bit. You guys know sometimes you get a, I don't know what you call it, cast on itis or something. Like if I finished a few big projects, you know, I wrote up the pattern for this. So it was uh, kind of like engaged, 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 and then a little bit of a crash. <laughs> and then like, what do I do next? And I didn't have anything simple on the needles that I could just pick up and knit, you know, like a pair of socks or anything because uh, I was working so much on this uh, monogamously, so it took me a little while to find something new, but um, I went to my stash of magazines and pattern books and just had a fun look around, just kind of like, what do I actually want to make now? What what kinds of patterns um, will help me increase some of the, the techniques and the skills that I've been wanting to work on? And I found an old knit scene from Interweave from 2014, I think it is, yeah, fall of 2014, and I had earmarked a few patterns, one of which is the cover and pattern cover pattern. This is the East Nook Pullover by uh, Kristen, uh, I think her last name is pronounced Orme or Orm, oh it's O-R-M-E, Kristen Orm or Orme, and this is the East Nook 
pullover. It's really, really cool because it has a built-in pocket and a hood, neither of which I have done before. So I earmarked it in my pattern book here, a couple other uh, images of it, so you can see kind of the back. It has a great uh, textured pattern that runs up the back of the hood, uh, that runs all through the pocket and the front panel, and it has some interesting shaping on the back, uh, which I, of course, modified <laughs> just a little bit. So this is my uh, East Nook pullover so far, hoodie, uh, and I've knit the pocket. You, it's a bottom-up sweater, so uh, it has a really cool pocket already built in. You can see it's like a little, um, like a hand warmer kind of a thing, and the pocket has all of this really great all of these different kinds of textured stitches and patterns on it. And then when you rejoin the pocket here, you keep this beautiful I-cord edging going up into the rest of the textured pattern. So I am thus far on this uh, sweater, and it does have a little bit of a uh, elongated back uh, with some short rows and whatnot, as you saw in the photo. So that is coming along, but it has been a little, put a little bit, the brakes have been put on that a little bit, uh, because of some sample knitting and test knitting that I'm in the middle of. But the wool that I'm using for that, kind of surprising to me actually that I'm doing double gray pullovers um, back to back. But it's interesting that grays can be so different. So uh, this is, this gray is uh, a really kind of a light, uh, it feels almost like a woolly spun kind of yarn, whereas this gray uh, is the prairie spun DK from Brown. Uh, sheep and Company in Rain Cloud, and it's a different color gray. It's so I love I love that even among the grays, there can be so much really cool variation. Um, and so you know, and I'm and I'm also thinking a lot. Uh, Albina of LB Handknits was posting and talking about um, kind of creating a wardrobe um, of very wearable objects and colors that you actually plan. You know, that's like your palette of colors, and uh, I. I just started thinking to myself, you know, some of the sweaters that I wear most often are uh, simple, kind of heathered, uh, single color sweaters, and it, it would be really great to have a few in my wardrobe that are just just very wearable sweaters. And that's what I did with my alias sweater and um, uh, with a couple other ones, which I can't remember right now off the top of my head. I feel like I've been knitting so many sweaters lately. But these two uh, are going to be like staples of my wardrobe, and I'm pretty happy about that. So. Thank you, Albina, for the tip on thinking about wardrobe and a consistent kind of interesting color palette that works for a lot of different things. Uh, okay, so if those are my couple of the FOs and whips, I also have a test knit going for Albina, which I'm not going to say too much about um, because she hasn't released the pattern yet, and the pattern's coming out in a book in uh, September. So it'll be really exciting. I can't wait to show you and talk to you more about it. But I am knitting it out of this really chunky yarn, which... To be honest, I've never knit out of this chunky a yarn. You can see it's almost like uh, pencil roving. It's really a very, very chunky, <laughs> thick yarn. And it knits up like this. So you can see it's a, it's a beautiful kind of blue, royally blue, that has um, a little bit of depth to it, which I like quite a bit. Uh, and so this will be another uh, LB Hand Knits sweater, which is a top-down, a uh, very beautiful kind of chunky quick knit um, that I'm looking forward to working on this month so that uh, I can give her some feedback before the book comes out in September. <laughs> it's so much going on. It's really, really exciting. Uh, okay, so that's all the kind of like stuff that's in progress. And what I'd like to do is shift over to a little bit of cashmere discussion. You know, cashmere is something that when I started knitting, uh, it was kind of like the goat, it was the fiber that was like Shangri-La, it was like the fiber that you could never really imagine using or knitting with because it was just so precious, you know? Uh, and I actually, I only have one skein of cashmere in uh, my stash and I got it at a yarn festival, I think I got it at the Wisconsin Sheep and Wool Festival. Uh, and it was expensive, uh, and it was it's a, it's a very beautiful um, skein of cashmere, and I have yet to knit with it because it is so precious. Uh, so along comes June cashmere, and June cashmere is this. Got some of their um, 
info and materials here that I'll hold up so you can see. June Cashmere is a pretty uh, new uh, yarn company. They started in 2016, so just a couple years ago. And uh, they put out a call on, I think it was on Instagram or via email, something like that, for, for sample knitters for their fall uh, line of knitwear. And if you've ever looked at their website, um, you can see that there's their last line of knitwear. Is, it includes all kinds of beautiful things like shawls, um, baby sweaters, uh, nice accessories like mittens and hats, but also um, regular, regular adult sweaters. Uh, and from designers that you would totally recognize and admire and appreciate. Um, and I knew the n I know the new fall line has uh, a sweater, for example, that's knit by Noragon, or that was designed by Noragon, uh, and just a, a bunch of other really great designers. So they they have great <laughs> they have a great aesthetic kind of sense of like what is good for their yarn and, and how their yarn really knits up into these beautiful objects that are that are good for texture, that are good for color work, that are good for lace and DK. That's those are the two um, weights of yarn that they have. So when they put out the call for sample knitters, I put my hat in the ring and uh, I heard back from Amy Swanson, who is the U.S. operations manager for uh, June Cashmere. And we had a fun conversation because it turns out she, uh, in a past life, she was an academic as well. And we have we, we had a lot in common and uh, she, she actually studied here in uh, Urbana for her degree. So we, we got to talking and uh, it ended up with uh, my, I agreed to do a, a couple different sample knits, uh, two hats and a set of mittens for them. So she sent over the yarn and the yarn is gorgeous. Let me show you. This is, these are the colors for the, and they're kind of partially knit up already because I've been working on these samples. These are the colors for the hats and mitts. So this is stone crop over here. This blue is June sky, which is quite beautiful. And this is sea glass over here. I always want to call it sea foam, but it's sea glass, and I think sea glass is more appropriate. I just like calling it sea foam. So those are the some of the beautiful colors that they sent over. And they're all in the DK weight of uh, yarn. They have both a DK and a lace weight. And then for the other hat, I'm going to do a combo. This is the main color for the other hat that I'm going to be knitting up. And uh, it is a little bit hard to see on this camera. It's a deep, deep kind of cherry red. It's called black cherry. And it's going to be knit up with this as a kind of contrast color and a pom-pom, I think, if I have enough yarn left over from the first set. This is their lace weight. And this you can definitely see. This is a beautiful kind of mossy green. Uh, in the colorway moss. <laughs> it is a lace weight yarn. And so the lace weight yarn that they um, they have is uh, about 300 yards for, per skein uh, for 50 grams, about 300 yards for the lace, and about 150 yards, yeah, for the uh, DK, for the 50 grams of DK. So the skeins look very similar, but as you, you all know from yarn weights, the lace has pretty much double the yardage of a DK. And so you could knit a sweater out of either of those and I think they if I'm remembering right from their website they have sweaters um, in both weights and they if they don't have them up right now I know in the fall line there's a lace weight sweater that is really really gorgeous and I'm really I really want to knit it uh, and I think this moss color is might be a really beautiful color for it so I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, June cashmere because I was interested you know, as I started doing these sample knits for them, and I'll show you how the um, the yarn knits up because sometimes that is of interest to you all. So here is just a plain kind of ribbing. This is not blocked or anything. It is a three by one kind of plain ribbing that you can see there. Uh, you can see the kind of beautiful stitch definition that you get with this DK weight yarn. Um, so I started, you know, talking to Amy about the company, and since it's just brand new from 2016, like how did it come about and, and what's going on there. Uh, and I started to do, she sent me some links and then I started to do some research on cashmere yarn and I thought it would, might be a really interesting podcast segment to kind of talk a little bit about cashmere and June cashmere in particular and kind of the work that's going on around this yarn. Um, because I know from from watching uh, other podcasts like Sarah of Fiber Trek um, and Anna of Dunkelgran or Rachel of Wool and Spinning, 
for a lot of us, it's really important to think about where our yarn comes from. We don't want to, I mean, sure, there are the beautiful skeins that we see at a yarn show and we pick them up and take them home with us. But, uh, you know, when we're knitting an entire sweater's worth of yarn uh, or, you know, we're really just thinking like sustainably about where our yarn comes from. It's, it's a, there are some really great stories out there. And a lot of folks are interested in, if you're in the United States, you want to knit with yarn from the U.S. that was grown here, milled here, dyed here, you know, all that kind of stuff. If you're in Germany, you want, a, you know, to find a local yarn there uh, where you maybe know how it was farmed or what was going on with its production. Uh, and so that these kinds of stories do matter to a lot of us. And I think it's, uh, the June cashmere story is pretty interesting. So, so the first question is, is usually like, what is cashmere? And I really didn't have a technical sense of it uh, until I started looking, looking around. So cashmere comes from goats and it comes, traditionally it's combed from the underbelly of goats. And if the goats are living in a kind of, um, just like with wool, if they're living the harsher, the kind of colder environment that they're living in, the softer and better the um, downy undercoat will be because that, that's what keeps them warm in these kind of really cold or mountainous uh, climates. So cashmere generally tends to be about 13 to 16 microns and four to five centimeters in length. Uh, these are the technical details for anyone's interested. I'm interested in this kind of stuff, so I thought I'd share with you. Um, per goat, you can get about 120 to 150 or 60 grams of fiber. Uh, so one of these schemes is, schemes is 50 grams of fiber. So you might get, uh, you know, the, the equivalent of two to three skeins worth of fiber from uh, a single goat. So the crimp, for those of you who are interested, who are, for those of you who are spinners who might be interested in this kind of thing, is about seven waves per centimeter. Now, the cashmere goats that uh, uh, June cashmere uh, is, is gathering their cashmere from, uh, they're actually coming from small uh, farmers and families uh, in Kyrgyzstan. And I was gonna show you a little map of Kyrgyzstan. I'll try to post it in the video here so that you can see a map of where Kyrgyzstan is in the world. Uh, it's a fairly landlocked country, uh, about the size of South Dakota, I've been told. Uh, and, you know, elevations of 10 to 20,000 feet. Uh, and for those of you who like to go backpacking in the mountains, you know, the Rockies, uh, there are 14ers out there and some peaks that are um, taller than that. So, we, you know, we're talking like Rocky Mountains and taller <laughs> in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, so a pretty harsh uh, kind of mountainous climate where these families are uh, herding their goats and breeding them and keeping them uh, domesticated. And what's really interesting about what's going on with June cashmere is that um, the, the cashmere market uh, has really fluctuated depending on different things uh, such as politics and economics and, and all kinds of social forces that I won't necessarily go into here. Um, but uh, when Kyrgyzstan uh, solidified its independence in the 90s, it, you know, it needed to set up a new kind of economy. Um, and part of that economy has been uh, agriculture and uh, animal husbandry. Um, and that it's it's been somewhat shaky. It's been um, taken, they, a lot of the, the folks who are breeding the cashmere goats have been somewhat taken advantage of by other big countries, conglomerates, corporations, middlemen, uh, who have, you know, wanted to create markets for, um, things like Kashgora, where cashmere goats are interbred with Angora goats, uh, so they can get more fiber out of them, um, and if, if middlemen are coming and kind of buying up fiber in bulk, they're not necessarily thinking about the quality of that fiber. They just want to get enough of it. And uh, the kind of farming of that, that fiber has had impacts on the environment. Um, you know, over farming, but the goats are out eating too much of the pasture. Uh, they're not, their nutrition isn't great. Uh, they're being sheared rather than combed. And so, uh, you know, in the harsh climates, they could get cold and sick. Uh, so there, there have been a lot of kinds of issues with the, the harvesting of cashmere and kashgora um, in these regions of the world. And one of the things that June Cashmere is trying to do is kind of shift the focus from uh, kind of like masses of fiber to how valuable the fiber is and how, um, how much investment the farmers themselves can 
put into the raising of the goats and get out of the raising of the goats. So if they're paid more for the fiber that they're harvesting, then they can in turn put that money and uh, knowledge and value back into the herds of goats that they're domestically raising. So that's kind of one of the basic principles that's going on with June Kashmir. Um, and Saya is the, um, the founder uh, and kind of uh, the brains behind the operation. And what he's done is to try to bring um, bring back, in a lot of ways, some traditional knowledge about combing goats. And it, and it sounds like there are um, plenty of elders in Kyrgyzstan in these, in these communities who do remember when the goats were combed for their fiber, when there was a different kind of marketplace available for the fiber. Um, and what Sai is doing and what Jimmy Kashmir is doing is saying, okay, we're going to pay you more for the fiber, but what we need is a different kind of fiber, a certain kind of level of fiber. And so they're providing combs for the families to be able to um, purchase and then use to comb the fiber. They're buying the fiber directly from the farming families who are raising the goats. Uh, they're encouraging this combing instead of shearing model. Uh, and they're, they're kind of creating value in the fiber um, so that that value can then be paid back to the farmers. Is That's the idea of what's going on. So that kind of model and that kind of yarn story, it may be important to some of you who are interested in thinking about why you might want to buy um, June Cashmere's cashmere rather than some Kashgora or some cashmere that you might find at a big box store or something like that. Um, there is a sense with June Cashmere that there is an investment in the people who are raising the cashmere goats um, in the kind of genetic line and the breeds of these cashmere goats that uh, were fairly isolated up in the mountains. Um, and you might, if you're looking online and trying to Google some of this information, you might find that the, these particular goats are called Jadari goats. And Jadari, as far as I can tell, means local. Um, so they were, they're kind of like uh, the goats that were preserved up in the mountains from any kind of interbreeding um, for this Kashgora kind of operation. Uh, and so this yarn story, you know, it, it's a story of recognizing the labor of farmers. It's a story about recognizing um, the importance of uh, maintaining certain kinds of breeds of uh, fiber animals and uh, recognizing the kind of labor that goes into the production of, you know, just a single skein of yarn. So, uh, and this yarn, by the way, it, it's, it is raised in Kyrgyzstan, uh, then it's sent to Europe for de-herring. Uh, I, I believe it's spun in Scotland right now and dyed in Maine. Uh, and there's a kind of, I think there's a kind of movement to try to localize some more of those um, processes to Kyrgyzstan. Uh, I think Sai has been living there for a few years now, but like I said, the company is only a couple years old. So I have a feeling that June Kashmir is gonna continue to evolve uh, in terms of the kind of yarn that it's producing and how it's producing that yarn and how much it's traveling from place to place. And my guess is that's gonna shrink uh, more toward Kyrgyzstan uh, and or to you know a part of the US, maybe Maine where some of the dyeing is done or spinning could be done there. Um, but that's my sense is that there's a sh there's going to be a shrinkage in the company to to try to keep all of those processes more localized. It seems to be part of their philosophy and where they they might be going in the future. Um, so how much uh, let's see how much is this yarn? That's something that a lot of us think about because if you're thinking about a sweater quantity of yarn, you're thinking, well, how much is it going to cost? Um, so June cashmere. If you're if you're looking for either a DK weight skein or a lace weight skein. They're about, right now, I think they're $44 each. And yes, that might sound expensive for, you know, a skein of yarn where, you know, if you get some wool, you can probably get a skein of wool at a big box store really cheap. We all know that. Um, but if you're thinking about the story behind the yarn, you're thinking about actually paying more of a fair um, price for the amount of labor that's going into it uh, and for, you know, a, a hope that there would be um, an even more transparent process of um, transitioning or transporting the yarn from the actual people who are growing it to, uh, you know, a market in the U.S., then this is uh, a company that's invested in trying to make those kinds of moves transparent um, and trying to make the kind of... Uh, 
amount of labor that goes into a yarn transparent. And that does get transferred to the consumer, and I think that's the way it should be in a lot of cases. So uh, this yarn is really cool to knit with. I will say it is certainly uh, worth it because if you're interested in cashmere and the kind of like hand feel of cashmere and the softness of it, um, I found that this yarn really responds well to, as you're knitting it, uh, it kind of warms up. It kind of um, seems to release a little bit of its oils and all the goodness and whatnot. Uh, and as I, I washed and blocked the first bit of this sample, which was a hat, um, you could just feel the yarn kind of like relax and kind of start to bloom, which is what they talk about. Um, when, when anyone talks about cashmere, they talk about the bloom of cashmere. So like once you, when you knit with it, just like with wool, once you wash it and kind of handle it and move it around, it really comes into its own. Um, as you're, I mean, on the skein and just in the cake or the ball, it's it's really interesting to handle cashmere like this because it feel it has a feel almost like um, cotton when you first touch it. It doesn't feel like a, a wool when you first touch it, but uh, as you sort of work with it and knit with it, it gets softer and softer. And then as you wash it a couple different times, and I've been told that the best way to dry it is actually to dry it outside. <laughs> and I haven't tried that yet because I'm, a, I'm knitting samples and I don't want to leave my knit samples outside for the birds and squirrels to carry away. Um, but uh, I have heard that the best way to dry it is outside. Uh, Needless to say, uh, as you work with this yarn, it just, even just this ball of yarn, uh, from when I first um, started using it to now, it's just softened up remarkably. And it's just one of these yarns that takes a little bit of love and care to, to get it to get to its fully realized potential. Um, knitting with it is really great because it is, the DK is six strands, I think it's six, there are a lot of little strands here. I'm trying to count them all. One, two, three, four, yes, yeah, six strands um, plied together. So it's a very strong yarn, I found. I've been really kind of pulling on it. I've been working on a pair of mitts on my, um, my little Addy tiny ones. <laughs> what are they called? Addy, uh, what's the, uh, what are they called? Oh, the crazy trios, that's what they're called. Uh, and I've been kind of tugging, tugging it shut around that, um, that transition and it's a strong yarn it's not going anywhere uh, so I was really glad to see that and I like the way that it knits up it's really great for the textured stitches I worked on a one of the samples I did was that hat and it has an all-over textured pattern and those cables just pop so beautifully with this yarn especially because of all the plies that it has um, the lace weight I believe has fewer plies which is what you'd want in a lace weight yarn I think it's two or three, can't quite find the end here. Where are you, end? Um, it looks like three, it's a three ply, but they're really tiny plies. Let's see if you can see this on the camera. They're really tiny little plies. And the other thing I'd say about this yarn, and this was like the best treat I got when Amy sent along um, the yarn, is that she sent a shade card for the yarn. And I'm just gonna give you a quick peek here. I think I think the camera can handle it. This is a shade card of what their current um, colors are. So the first one you have number one over here is a natural unbleached, undyed. And then it goes on from there all the way through kind of espresso and, and silvers to these beautiful curries over here. And then uh, stone crop is this one. That's the one I showed you in the, in the kind of pinkish and moss, which is the lace weight, is over here. And I hope the camera's really picking up on these because they are the most gorgeous colors. And I was talking to Amy about this a little bit, and I said, you know, I really, really love this palette. And I'm not always drawn to a full palette of yarn. Like, I would knit something out of every single one of these colors. Um, but I think it's because of the heathered nature of these colors, and that's because You've got your natural over here, one of your naturals. And Amy, I asked Amy about this and she said, you know, there's the natural gray, but there's also a natural brown. Uh, and if you use a, a gray or a brown kind of natural color as your base when you're dyeing, you end up, it's almost like an over dye because you have this beautiful gray in the background that you're adding color to. And so you end up with these heathered colors, which I think have a lot more depth and kind of, um, richness to them than more of a plain 
uh, yarn that's dyed on white. Um, so let me show you that one more time because it's, it's just so pretty. I'm having a hard time choosing which one I would knit with and I kind of think I might want to knit a lace weight sweater um, out of some of this yarn. So it's going to be hard to choose. But I really love the fact that um, she sent over this shade card because I felt like it, it just does the yarn so much more justice. Um, to see it in all these, this wide range of colors, uh, and to see those heathered, um, really beautiful shades in there. So that's my yarn story for the day. <laughs> all about cashmere and June cashmere in particular. Uh, I'm going to put a bunch of links uh, in the show notes for anyone who's interested in learning a little bit more because June cashmere has been reviewed in a bunch of different places and by a bunch of different folks. Clara Parks has a review of the yarn um, back when it first came out. So it was a different, it was a different iteration of the yarn, um, but she has a review out about it. Vogue Knitting did a story on it. Um, Spinoff did a story on it. Uh, there have just been a lot, there's been a lot of coverage of June cashmere out there in the world. Um, I'm also going to put some links up to the um, Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. There's a PDF about cashmere where I got some of my technical information. Uh, and I think it's a really interesting read if you're interested in thinking about um, not only what cashmere is, but how cashmere production has worked, what the history of it is, all of those kinds of things. So I'll put all those links in the show notes uh, over on the blog if anyone's interested in following up and learning more about this yarn story. So in this last segment, I wanted to bring to you one of the final Knit Together Project squares that I've received. And if you're uh, interested in the Knit Together Project, you can head over to the website. I'll put some links in the show notes. Basically, folks are sending in eight by eight inch blanket squares and I'm putting them all together in a blanket and each of the squares has an awesome story behind it. So this is one of the last ones I've received and it's, uh, it's been a few weeks since I've had it but I haven't been able to podcast. So this one is from Dana of Daylight Knits and Dana sent this story to go along with her square. She said, the block is made from uh, of alpaca from a farm near me called Old Homestead Alpacas. It was started in 2014 on one of the last remaining 10 acres of an original homestead uh, located near us, settled by a pioneer named Nathaniel Golson in 1875. He was conveyed the land by Ulysses S. Grant. <laughs> it's quite a story to this little square. So uh, Mike and Elaine Vandeveer are the uh, operators of old homestead alpacas, and they raise flowers and plants to naturally dye all the fiber and yarn that comes out of the farm. Uh, and so this Dana's mother uh, purchased the yarn for her at Pearl 2, a uh, local yarn shop, and it's her favorite rustic color uh, dyed naturally from matter root. She, uh, Dana chose the pattern from one first printed in the 1800s in Australia uh, because of the lacy, uh, because of the lace, the chevron pattern and the stitches represent the ups and downs of life and the knit stitch itself. I wanted to, in some small way, she says, become part of the knitting community and sought this opportunity to do so. Dana, thank you. It is a beautiful square and a wonderful set of stories, a really rich set of stories that you've shared with us. And I have to point out that uh, Dana's package came in an envelope with an alpaca on it which is just pretty much too cute for words. So thank you, Dana, it's a gorgeous square. And if you're interested in uh, sending in one for the Knit Together project, get to it because August is upon us and that is the final deadline for these squares uh, so that I can start knitting up the blanket. Uh, so that's it for today. I hope all of these yarn stories and uh, projects and finished objects will keep you inspired to be knitting and uh, creating more yarn stories for yourself. And until next time, I will see you later. Bye. Yeah.